We are Gilbert and George. We are here in our studio to celebrate becoming the Artists of Honour for the Braffa Art Fair in Belgium. And we are very excited. <laughs> We've always had a special relationship with Belgium from the very, very early days. The Belgian people are our greatest collector and we thank them for that. We'd like we very just much to sing you a song. And it goes like this. There'll always be a Belgium, and Belgium shall be free. If Belgium means as much to you as Belgium means to me. Thank you. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, there are many important dates in art history, but one of the most important in modern art history has to be around the 26th of September 1968, which was when Gilbert and George met at St. Martin's School of Art in London. Um, I've been lucky enough to know Gilbert and George since, I think, 1997. Um, but I still am aware of being in the presence of people who feel mythic, who feel slightly not of this world. Um, I always think of them as my supernatural friends. And I wondered whether, Gilbert and George, you would mind beginning this talk by telling us all the story of how you first met and also how you knew that you had a vision together as a single artist. I think since we were tiny children, we both in our separate worlds and separate countries had a conviction that we wanted to say something by using art. And Gilbert came through Europe st steadily to London and I came from darkest Devon very slowly to London to the advanced sculpture course at St. Martin's School of Art. It was an unofficial course, it was a pet course of the head of sculpture at the top of St. Martin's. And in 1967, of course, we felt very, very privileged that we were living in a modern world where all of the things we wanted were available. We were in the Charing Cross Road, on the edge of Soho, and the change in Covent Garden. The permissive society was a positive term. <coughs> Anything goes was a positive term. Free love was a positive term. Not that we engaged in anything like that. All the other students did that and we didn't. We were late developers. We caught up later and, and made up for time. It was quite exciting because uh, I, brought, I was born in the Dolomites and when I was five or six years old, all what I wanted to be, I was, wanted to be an artist. So in the Dolomites, if you wanted to be an artist, you had to go to the, the wood carving school in some, in, what do you call it, in Selva Gardena. That I went when I was 14 years old, I went to a wood carving school for three years. We had to draw, what do you call, drawing, draw, as, as carving and all the stuff. And then I felt that I wasn't, wasn't going anywhere with that. I, I did that, so I went out and I moved towards Austria, where I did another art school for one year. And then I realized that even that was not, not the right stuff. So I went to Munich. I, I was in Munich for six years doing the Academy of Art. And it was a certain old-fashioned Academy of Art. Even then, I was dreaming of something more modern. And so I saw what you call an exhibition in Munich of the uh, young generation sculptors that, involved, that inspired me in some way. And I, had this, I heard these rumors that London was the place where it was it. So I thought, I might as well go there. Mm -hmm. So I went there in some way, and uh, they took me up. That was ex extraordinary, like a fate. You know? So I went up to this, the top floor where George was, and he, he took an interest in me, because not the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> and so we started to walk up in the evenings to see the London, 
and we started to see the East End of London. It was so fascinating for me. It felt like walking into a uh, what you call uh, a book of Dickens in some way. All the all the trams were there. All the light was yellow. All the streets were narrow. It felt like Dickens, and that's what we did day and night for a long time. And uh, in some way, we created created a world for ourselves that we could be together in some way. We, we found art rather than practice being artists. All of our fellow students were hard at work practicing being artists. They wanted to achieve the status of artists and we thought we were artists even though we didn't have anything. And it was very, we were very lucky because being lower class, coming from lower class families, we didn't have the family safety net that all of the middle class students had. And so when we left college, we were alone and penniless and all of the other students could apply for grants or a, a, a Gulbenkian foundation or a subsidized studio or a part-time teaching job. All of the things that the other people thought were essential for getting on in life were not available to us. And that was very good. We had to find our own way. But we only became alive when we were, what do you call, we had to leave St. Martin's School of Art. Before St. Martin's School of Art and all the art schools were only practicing. That's what we feel. Only then, when we were stranded, alone in the streets of London, without a studio, and we still wanted to be artists, that's when we had this visionary idea that we could be the art. So in that moment, we don't have we don't need a studio. In that moment, you can make art as emotional, that they live in. It's not bronze, it's not marble, it's not uh, what you call plastic, whatever it is. It's human. And that's when we started to do the human art, and we are still doing that. We realized that we were opposed to the, the, the oppression of formalism, shape and angle, and all of the things that we were taught at school was only to do with the form and never to do with meaning or content. And we realized we wanted to make an art that, would be, that we would be able to address people wherever they lived in the world, whatever their education or religious backgrounds, that we could find a, a humanistic content. So we would try to create an art that would deal with death, hope, life, fear, sex, money, race, religion, shitty, naked, human, world, so that we can speak to people of all age groups and of all backgrounds. What, what do you, now, what would you say was the first um, piece of art by Gilbert and George? Well, we, we, we always said that it was, the, it was finding art, the idea of art, not the, not the form of art, but the essence, the meaning of art. <clears throat> and that was when we were walking the streets of London and realizing all of the people who came before us to build the, our Western world. Because we do believe every day that the world is a greater success than it's ever been. People are more privileged and more healthy and more happy than ever before. And our world, our own Western world, our world of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and the writers and the thinkers and the poets and the playwrights and the railway stations. And we walked through London and saw the railway stations and the tube stations and the hotels and the police stations and the palaces and the prisons and the alleyways and the shops and the clubs. And we thought that was an extraordinary thing, an amazing privilege. And then we came across very near Euston Station, a utopian housing estate from the 1920s. And it was very beautiful, with white stucco and beautiful gardens in front. And it was so ideal and so special that the poles that held up the washing lines had on the top filials. They were Royal Dalton ceramic birds, a different one on each pole. And we thought that's an extraordinary way to live. What an ideal world. And in front of the flats, there were beautiful gardens. And in front of the gardens, there were retail units. There was a, a washing shop for washing your clothes. There was a, a liquor store, a, a news agent, a tobacconist, all of the things that you would need. And then there was also another shop, which was very mysterious because it sold all of the things that the people living in the flats left behind 
when they moved on in life. So all of the odd, the detritus of human life, the, the lampshade with a hunting scene, the, the, the paperback books already read and finished with, the, the, the broken saucepan. And amongst all these odd bits and pieces, we found a record, a small gramophone record. And we read the title, which we liked very much because it felt that it was all to do with where we were living and how we were living. And the title was Underneath the Arches. Well, Underneath the Arches, the railway arches near where we live in the East End of London, were, were habited by people who were lost and damaged. There were hundreds and thousands of tramps living in our neighborhood. There were more tramps than other people. So there were three huge hostels for damaged men, a huge hostel for damaged women. Many were people who were damaged by the First World War, very elderly people. Many people damaged by the Second World War. Many people damaged by the sex laws, the pre-1967 sex laws. And so they were, many of them, living underneath the arches. And we took the record home to the East End, and then we found a wind-up machine to, to play it. And we were amazed that the words altogether were exactly like life was then and how it can be even now for many people. And the words were, the writs I never sigh for, the Carlton they can keep. There's only one place that I know, and that is where I sleep. Underneath the arches, I dream my dreams away. Underneath the arches, on cobblestones we lay. Every night you'll find me, tired out and warm. Happy when the daylight comes creeping, heralding the dawn. Sleeping when it's raining, and sleeping when it's fine. La dee 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 da 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 da. Pavement is my pillow, no matter where we stray. Underneath the arches, I dream my dreams away. And there in that little song were all the thoughts and feelings from which we have based the message and messages of our art. Because when we hear that song now, I mean, it's, it is so beautiful. And obviously, when you made the singing sculpture, that song took your message as artists around the world because you became incredibly famous. It's quite exciting because once we did the singing sculpture, we became it. We became the art. Yeah. And that revo revolutionized everything that we ever did after that. We were able to be human people that are the art and are able to project feelings yes. to the public. That's what we always feel. We are projecting ideas to what you call of a visionary idea of the world, a visionary soul, a visionary artist. That's what we are. And it was extraordinary. And then we went all over. We went to Holland, to Germany, to Portugal, Australia, to America. We even here in, in Brussels, we did a small, uh, uh, what do you call? Brus Brussels, Brussels, Brussels made it. Work. Brussels made it, really, because we, we, it was a, what we now call a pop-up gallery. I think it was a ladies' dress shop that was out of use. And a very nice gentleman contacted us called Herman Dullid and said that he would like to bring the singing sculpture to Brussels. And we, we came over and did the singing sculpture. It was not a particularly auspicious evening. It, it was raining, and, but it was extraordinary. At the end of the evening, uh, uh, we thought a very old lady, she was much younger than we are now, came up to us and said with this wonderful Central European accent, my name is Ileana Sonnebend, and I'm opening a gallery in New York, and I want you to do the inaugural exhibition. This was an extraordinary opportunity for baby unknown <coughs> artists. And that, that's launched us across the Atlantic in the, to North America. But a most important person for us was Conrad Fisher. Because uh, what called, there was a, a show going on in the ICA. It was called When Attitudes Become Form. You know? And we thought we would be invited, but we were not invited. 
So we crashed the opening with a living sculpture and we stood in the middle of the room and we stole the show and that was and the end of the evening a person came up to us and said I'm Conrad Fisher, you do something with me in Dusseldorf, ah? Uh, and that was the most important art dealer in Europe at that time. Because when you, at uh, this early stage, you were already, you chose to wear your suits, which for young artists in the late 1960s, early 70s, to be dressed smartly and conservatively would have looked quite unusual. But in addition to this, as living sculptures, you had metallic, metallized heads. Yes. Yes, that was done later to remove ourselves from the public. When you did Attitude to Come Form, when you crashed that, did you have the metal that was, heads? That was with the multicolored heads, yes. Where did that Sorry. come from, that idea of the multicolored heads? I think, I think just to remove ourselves, to make us to make us a, a living sculpture, that we weren't the same as the other people in the room. So I like to make ourselves some kind of alien from another planet. And even we did a meeting once, living sculpture in Amsterdam. We are allowed to stay in the steps of the State League Museum because of, uh, there was an artist called Geir von Nell who introduced us to the State League Museum and did this afternoon, a living sculpture. They still have the poster of that sculpture in the State of Museum. And it was extraordinary for us to be able to move into these institutions and to be different, be artists, and what to go, accepted in some way. So we, we, we always said in some way we were, as artists, we were born on the steps of the State of Museum. It was an extraordinary... We still meet people who saw the living sculpture when they were five and seven and eight years old who remember it. Extraordinary. It's very interesting because I'm still discovering um, uh, reports and reviews of your very early um, art together. And I found um, something about when you did the living sculpture in New South Wales in Australia. Yes. And um, the person uh, who wrote up the, the uh, sculpture said that people in the audience uh, were both frightened of you, that they found you very otherworldly and scary, but at the same time, people wanted to come up to you and tell you their problems. That's true. And tell you quite emotional things. And was, was that a common experience, that you realized you'd become almost like shaman or something? Oh. Yeah. No, we call it Mad Vickers. <laughs> <laughs> More. No, I think the singing sculpture can address the life of the viewer. So, so children, children watching it have an idea and a thought about what, what these two people on the table are or what, what, what they're feeling. Uh, Middle-aged people, everyone has a different slant on what it means to them. People, it reminds people of distant relatives or pe people are sometimes tearful, yes? We always see people, young people coming in looking rather amazed and then very, 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 very slowly holding hands and watching the sculpture together. We always think that's very moving. But it was a very exper experimental period those days because we wanted to be famous and we wanted to be seen. So we used to do this postal sculpture that we used to send out to different people. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, talking about our feelings of the day. Let's say it was snowing outside, we went to make some cocoa, we were drinking in front of the window, and we made a small drawing of that. We used to send them out like 300, 300 people. Like uh, we got a list from uh, Conrad Fisher, a list of artistic people, and it was extraordinarily successful in some way because they felt we were able to enter the house. You know? We didn't have to buy an artwork anymore. We were in the house with our vision. And then we used to do even what we call magazine sculptures. We did a very famous one in 1969 that was, uh, that was called Gilbert the Shit and George the Cunt, and it was extraordinary. Overnight. And it, and it was exhibiting in the gallery in Dusseldorf that we had the best confirmation of our belief of our slogan, Art for All because we had a little exhibition there in Dusseldorf. It was a, a, a wonderful evening, the private view. Uh, everyone had drinks and was very celebratory. There was a dinner afterwards. I think we even sold 
two pictures. It was all a great success. And we came into the gallery the next morning and uh, there was somebody tidying up the gallery and the, the glasses and things. And there was the owner of the gallery sitting looking very glum and very miserable. And we asked him if he had a hangover and he said, no, no, no. I said, well, what's wrong? And he wouldn't say. And then we pushed him to tell him what was wrong, why he was so downcast. And he said, the cleaning lady, she likes your exhibition. <laughs> so we, we, we knew we were right. After all, it, it was quite exciting in that time here when we started because Conrad said, why didn't you leave something behind, you know? Like the living structure, we couldn't be everywhere at the same time, you know? And it was complicated, so we started to have the idea to leave something behind, like messages, you know? And that's when we started to do these big drawings, like, uh, what called, what were they called? There was, there was very interesting, he said, do something with me in the gallery, yeah? Yeah. And we, we had to think, what did we know? And we realized that all that we actually knew, properly, solidly, and truthfully, was walking, viewing, viewing and okay. relaxing. So we, we knew a lot of other things, but not so well as those three things. And so we created this triptych, walking, viewing, and relaxing. And uh, he asked us how much it should be, and we'd never sold a work of art before and we never thought that we would sell a work of art and so we named a, a ridiculous sum of money just we thought as it's not going to be sold it might as well have a, a grand price and we said one thousand pounds which was an enormous sum of money in those days and the next day he sold it we were amazed. And what happened after? We started to do the drinking sculptures. <laughs> when um, I looked at some of the earlier pictures, um, say the pictures that you were making in the first half of the 1970s, um, the famous uh, monochrome and red, um, Bloody Life and Mental and Cherry Blossom, this work. Um, I'm, always, I'm, I'm still interested, are you as artists interested in beauty? In, in beauty. Beauty, yeah. beauty we, is our art, we say that. Don't beauty we? is our art. We, we admire and love beauty for all its fire and love and power and absurdity as the carrier of meaning, not for itself. It is the, we, we have the message and the messages and the thoughts and the feeling, and it is beauty that carries it to the viewer. It has to be, it's, it's not the boss. Beauty is not the boss. But it was quite interesting because in 71, 72, after having experiment with big drawing, we realized that we didn't like that form. We, because we felt that form felt like uh, existing form. It was not, it was too beautiful and we talked on the past, you know, like you could be like Renaissance drawings, you know? And we realized we didn't want that. We wanted an art that is up to date modern that can speak more direct to people. And that's when we started to do our fo first photo piece in some way in 71. And that became after that our own language. We developed it into a, a big picture in some way. It started out with uh, what a, a cluster of little images to make one picture. Then we managed to put them all together and create our own language that is still there, the same one. We like it. It is the negative and we like to make it artificially. We never like a color photograph. We want to make it artificially more powerful, more us, more ourselves. It's very powerful, important for us, that language. I, I sometimes think that it's only in the last kind of couple of years that I've begun to really understand, I think, what has um, driven you as artists for so long because we were talking, and I think it was you, Gilbert, who said that in a lot of ways your art is a pilgrim's progress. Mm. It's a visionary journey. You could say a spiritual journey. Yes. Pilgrim's progress, the, the most famous least read book in the world. Yeah. The only book that Oscar Wilde was allowed to have in prison, apart from the Bible and the prayer book. In, interesting, yeah. And he's buried very near where we live. And in the same cemetery is buried William Blake. In the same cemetery is buried Daniel Defoe. And in a very nearby cemetery is George Fox, 
the founder of the Quaker movement, and just down the road, all within walking distance of our house, is the house of John Wesley, the founder of the second biggest group of Christians in the world, if you count Catholics. And so we are surrounded by these figures that made, all together, made our world. We're very, very conscious of that. And who gets flowers every day? Only one of them. <laughs> William Blake. Not, not the other ones. I was going to say, it's, you're well known, particularly in recent years, uh, that you're very, very opposed to religion. And you made uh, groups of pictures and single pictures which state that very clearly. Um, mm. But at the same time, religious imagery has featured in your work, in your art, I should say, from the very, very early days. And I think, say, your wonderful film, The World of Guild and George, the first image that you see pretty much on the screen is of the church at the end of your road. Yeah. It's, it's very Can simple. Just, we, yeah. we, just, we just didn't want to be like the other artists who felt that they were superior, sophisticated atheists, and they accepted that maybe the, the builder or the cleaning lady goes to church. They made this very clear division. And we don't believe that because we are institutionally Christian or religious anyway. And we wanted, we wanted to deal with it. We didn't want to leave it out. And it was very curious. When we first started doing Christian pictures in the early 80s, all of the people around us in the art world thought that was a completely stupid move of us because they, they thought that religion was finished, we're in a modern, sophisticated world, which of course we were, and that, that was old. Of course, it, it turned out that religion was much more important than they thought. There, there are people killing each other for religion more now than in 1980. In some way, we are schizophrenic about that, but we know one that once we discover Darwin, we realize that the, the world is made up of all fake gods. Every god that they invented is a fake god. And believing in fake god for us is not right. That's why we, we made a human art that we are in charge of life. Human beings are in charge of how to behave. The morality of today is made by human beings, not by inventing a god to look down or put you into heaven or hell or damnation, all stuff. It's all artificial there. But humans are able to find a way to be, to accept each other in a better way. And that's why we believe that culture is the center of doing that. The many different levels of culture can make us feel different, behave different, and that's why we believe in the force of culture. The power of culture. We think that all of us, all of us in this room and beyond, are what music your grandparents did or did not listen to. You are what music they did or did not dance to. You are what poetry they may or may not have read. And, be, and we are cultural, able, and we vote. We vote culturally. And that's why we think culture is an advance of politics. That's why when journalists say, oh, do we need all this modern art nonsense? Surely we can manage without. We don't need culture. We say, well, if you go to a country, where there's no art museum or library or, or any, where there's no culture, we'll almost certainly need to hire a bodyguard. It's very dangerous. It is culture, it's culture that keeps us all free and safe, the two things that we need to be free and safe. And, and interestingly, although we're always opposed to religion, our f f favorite saying is ban religion, but one day we did, we did get the, a knock at our front door and we went and opened it, and there was a very elderly, very charming-looking clergyman. And he said, I'm sorry to trouble you, gentlemen. I just came here. I, I, I don't want to bother you. I just want to know that you, you did this thing called ban religion. Well, I think that's marvelous, marvelous. And we said, it's very, thank you, but perhaps you'd explain why you think that. He said, oh, it's very simple. He said, I still have my congregation. They come every week. And many of them are friends of mine. They're awfully nice people, very nice people. And of course, they're all very religious. But I don't really want them to be religious. I want them to be good. <laughs> we were very, very moved by that. 
room to this elderly person. And we know that very much that even when, where we live very near what they call the district where all the Muslims live. You know? And this, we feel in some way that now we have these religious wars going on all the time. Even because we used to be part of all these young people of Bangladeshi people in, in Brick Lane and all these places 30, 40 years ago. We actually in, in, involved them in our pieces, a lot of them. But recently, because of the, the mullahs came to England, no? and after that everything changed. They are allowed to kill for religious, because they have the real God, we, don't, we are infidels. And that's an amazing complex, we feel, for us. I mean, I remember in the uh, early 1980s, there was a certain group of critics who um, wanted to see your art as political and were quite outspoken in claiming that your art was right-wing and worse. I mean, they were saying, not well, worse, but they were looking at certain pictures and drawing certain conclusions from them. And I was wondering whether you have ever thought of yourselves as political artists. I think we're political in that we believe culture is in advance of politics, but we're not political in the sense of most artists. Most, most of our artists and most of our, our contemporary artists feel they're artists because they're critical. They're critical of I know, the bomb or the America or this. Or they have critical views about the world. They think there's something wrong with the world in many, many ways. And we don't. We are optimistic. We, we believe everything's fine. And we, we're, we don't like to be against anything. We like to be for things. So that when people come to the door to ask to, to sign a petition, if, if it's against something, we don't need to know what it is. We say, no, we would never sign against anything. If it's for something, We'll sign. We don't even need to know what it's for. For we sign. We probably sign for some horrible things, but at least we were always for. I mean, we we, are, we would call ourselves ordinary conservatives, like the farmers. Pol politically, yeah. Politically, like the ordinary farmers, they are conservative because they are part of the land and part of this and that and that. And in some way, even we prefer in the capitalism because art only thrives through that and nothing else. If not, you make a state art that is always sometimes very bad, like a Russian in communist country, and when the state takes over and dictates what an artist should be, that's why we believe in the freedom of the art, the outsider. We always have been outsider in London. We have never been part of the art world. We have never been part of anything except lonely people outside that are able to do whatever they want. That's what we want. We never, we never thought we were like the silly left-wing twitty artists, but we believe we are more social, socialistic than all of them put together. I think we have a, they all, all fell in love with politics and art. All the artists loved art and being uh, artistic and having artistic friends and artistic holidays. We never believed in that. We fell in love with the viewer of art and our relationship with the people who look at our pictures. Our definition of art is, the, the friendship that is formed between the viewer and the picture. That, like a love that, letter. That is the essence. Every, every picture we ever created is a visual love letter from us to the viewer. And for years we always said, we, we always said, art for all. That was one of our earliest slogans. And, and I think we've proved that we are able to have this thought transference idea with people in different countries and and more recently, we've added to Art for All, we've added the artists for the disenfranchised. And that is because we found we had very touching, moving support from people who had horribly difficult lives. All of the tramps we talked about earlier have, have died, that whole generation have gone entirely. And of course, they've been partly replaced by, by drug addiction. So there are teams of young drug addicts in London and where we live. And it's very, very moving to, f to see people who are a third of our age or a quarter of our age nearer to death than we are, very elegant, very beautiful, very thin, very dirty, very ragged, who feel that they know something of our art and they admire the art. One came up the other day, I love your art, my mum liked our art. She's dead now, but she did, and extraordinary.
And what about the, what they call, not the lorry driver? Oh, that's quite a good story. The lorry driver, the lorry driver on our big main road, Commercial Street, who slowed down when he saw us and screeched to a halt and poked his middle-aged shaven head out the window and said, Oi, Governor George, my life's a fucking moment. You're us in eternity. <laughs> and we, we love that. That's why we always make the art for our public, for our visual public. We, all, we want to confront the, our public with imagery that we do and to what we call stimulate in some many different ways. We never think of selling art. We only talk of our public. And that's why we're very excited by making big museum shows that are, you can walk into Gilbert and George's world. You see all the complicated about sexuality, uh, dr drinking, and what you call our neighbor people, young people, old people, all that stuff. But we love entering the G G world. That's why we always do these enormous shows, and that's why we always do catalogs that we design ourselves, and they are in, uh, with the idea of a person in front of it <coughs> every time. And they are always very cheap. They have to be even posters. We want them cheap. 10 quid signed. That creates another art world. Like in London, the White Cube, where we show, we did about to go 5,000 posters last time. No? We were able to sell 5,000 posters. And that creates an art world that is outside the so, the, the what you call, the, the few. I mean, I always wonder um, what about. There's a quality, what I'm trying to say, there's a quality in your art which seems, um, I hope this won't sound a bit far-fetched, it seems almost connected to prophecy. I remember going to see the nine dark pictures in Athens, and they articulated the sense of a world that was saying goodbye, a world that was kind of closing its doors, locking the shutters, um, a place of farewell and departure and sleep. And very shortly after that, there was the events in New York at 9-11. Um, I've spoken to people who feel that your Jack Free pictures with the Union Jack symbolism, the crazy people, the kind of the, the mad world of it, were a premonition of the conflict caused by Brexit. I've also spoken to people who feel that the scapegoating pictures with, you know, women in burkas on mobile phones, the sense of paranoia, sense of the city becoming very anxious and panicky. Yeah. So you can see where I'm going with this. Do you feel that ever that your art picks up on something that then we, we, we wouldn't think that we're able to predict anything. It's not, we're not conscious of that. We, we, we understand that it does sometimes, and we don't know exactly yes, why. But we, do, but we do believe that whenever we make a creative picture, as well as everything else that's involved, we're always very conscious to be sure that the picture takes account of the past, is of our time, and allows for the future. So past, present, and future has to be in each single artwork we create. It's very important to us. Now, back to the other part, what you're talking about is quite true, because our art is based on being artists in front of the world. It's not artists being part of going to galleries or speaking to artists. Our life being naked in front of the world. And so every time that we open the door, 12 phone and three, we walk up and down, and we see the new world. We see what is going on. We, we see in advance because it is there if you look. You just have to look. It's all there what is going to happen. But you don't have to be magician. It's there. Yeah, but you have this amazing ability, it seems, to isolate the key image in each so that when you make a new series of pictures, there's often very few elements in them. Generally, yes. Yeah. And yet, those elements are amazingly articulate. They become epic. I think that's because we never, we never said we wanted to show life or reflect life, even when people will see the world in our pictures. We are more intent on forming our tomorrows. We want 
tomorrow to be a little bit different because of the pictures we make. And, 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 and the world is a very, very different place from 67 when we started. It's in every way, everything is different. And that is partly a cultural change. It's not the vicar and the policeman who changed it. But even like the world, well, let's talk about the, the beard picture now. It was three or four years ago we started to see what every time we switched on the television, we started to see walls going up, no? And Brick wire. walls, barbed wire walls, fencing walls, all the stuff to, to normally you say, used to say we that... We said when we were children barbed wire was to keep animals in, now it's to keep humans out. And, and the other reality is that when we were teenagers you would never get a job as a cocktail waiter if you had a beard, and now you wouldn't get a job as a cocktail waiter if you didn't have one. <laughs> And we started to see all that so the, all this immigrant looking through the fence wall, through the barbed wire wall with the beards, with beards, because they are in somewhere different uh, culture. Than I, th I think we're even very privileged because our generation, we were war babies. We, we came through all of that and I, gr I grew up with the most common phrase was, things will get better. And amazingly, it did. And so we're... <laughs> We were very privileged that we saw all of that extraordinary change. But the other thing is that we like it as it is. We think it's extraordinary. Whatever life brings these days is just magic for us. We think everything has changed so much. Art, what you call the, the world is so big and so small that you are able to travel the world, you are able to form the world, you are able to go to millions of galleries, you are able to... <laughs> all the radio, television, or the books, the books and art and all, is so extraordinary. It's all culture in some way. And it's all fantastic. We, we always tell our young friends who have grumbles about life or jobs or whatever the grumbles are, we say you're showing enormous ingratitude to, towards the lives and the people who went before you who have arranged this great privilege for you. Mm. Um, Gil and George would love it if you would like to join in and ask some questions. Um, and there's somebody there. Have you changed as individuals, as people, and as artists over the years since you met? I think we believe that, it, we don't believe in change. Art, artists who change have very embarrassing retrospectives. But we, th <laughs> we, we think we evolved, and we think our evolution is the same as the viewers. We always remember childhood and crying and babies and food and teenage and love and jobs and life and death and relatives. So our evolution is much the same as it's a human evolution, yes. not, yes. A, not a stylistic It's evolution. very funny because in 1969 we wrote down the, the what they call the laws of the sculptors, you know, how to behave and everything. One. We are, and we are keeping to that. It's, nothing has changed. Okay, our art goes to different directions, like they come to so sexuality, drunkenness, or young people, or what go burkers, or bears, or something. But the vision is our vision that has nothing to do with us, what you call the journey. Our journey through life. Yes. I'm Mark from Rotterdam. I'm born in uh, 67. Could you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Um, Born 67 years. Yeah, um, so that's a long time, 51 years now. You know that you're together, or at least that time. You know each other so well. Is it also a possibility that we can maybe see in the future that you both make something, how you see the other after all those years? Oh, I, think, I think that's very simply that we are two people, but we're one artist. And it is... We, we, when we go to our studio, we leave our house, we go through our little backyard, we step into the studio without ideas, without plans. Because if we had plans or ideas, they would be things we already knew about. And we want to fall into some, we want to trip into some new truth, some new area of, of, of human sensibility. So, so it, the pictures will have to be how we are. So if you say the pictures we did in 1971, they are how we were. The D Dirty Words pictures we did in 77, they're like that because that is how we were. They're, lif they're lifted out from inside of ourselves. You can't take them from the sky 
or invent them. They have to be from inside. But we do take images. Every time we do a, we take, we make a new group of pictures. We go out there maybe for uh, what to call five or six months to take images. What speaks to us now? You know? Every picture has to speak to us. If they don't speak to us, we don't take the image. You know? So we are building up a big, uh, what they call, bank of new images to create our new images. But, and then we, we print them out on contact sheets and we have like full of tables with new images, maybe like 10,000 new images we did this summer for making the new pictures that we are, going, we are doing now. And then we are choosing that day where we go to the studio and we always feel we want to we have to close our eyes and choose from inside ourselves. We never want to see exactly what is going on outside there. It has to be what the world is inside ourselves. How we feel inside with closed eyes. And that's how we make our pictures. Every day we make at the moment designs. One, two, three, four, five. Every day I design for a new group of pictures. And it's quite exciting somewhere. You are able to go in without assistance to do our own vision, our own vision, like maybe artists used to do in some way before. But recently a lot of artists have full of assistance. We never want a person behind our back telling us what to do. And although we take all of these images, not knowing exactly why, the, the pictures have to more or less make themselves. We try not to interfere too much, but we know that we will never use an image that we've taken unless we have discovered its moral dimension. We will never use an image because it's nice or it has a good shape or a good color or a good angle or a good, it has to have a moral dimension. And we can explain that with a very simple story. For years we used to go out just after it rained and when the pavements were drying because that's the ideal condition for taking images of chewing gums on the street. You go very close with the camera, take that because everyone is different, ne never to be repeated. And, and we gathered these, we didn't put them in our pictures, and it took them again, I think, another year. And then one day we realized that, of course, they have a very obvious moral dimension. They're all, all over the streets of London, in the busy streets, in the more neglected streets. They're all put, the, each one is put there by an individual person who has a life. Some of those people may be dead, we don't know. Which ones of those people went to prison? Which ones are in love? Which, which ones were visit? So that's the moral dimension. They all represent an enormous range, potential range, of human activity. And then we could put them in the pictures. Well, we are very pleased that we managed to find this way of making pictures, no? Mm. And that is a structure of how to speak. And with us ourselves in the middle, always. Because we are the protagonist of our story, you know? We are what's called chucking all these images on the walls of museum with our feelings of inside and the public can what you call look at it they can be pro or against but they are part of they have to be part of us no mm -hmm. we want them to be understanding something mm -hmm. we don't want them to go out with, with, with the idea they didn't understand what we are about we to understand see. art our vision not art maybe life our life more than art we always say if the person goes to a museum and sees a very beautiful landscape with a field and a tree and a lane, they will drift past that and it won't have any particular meaning for their life. But if there's a policeman on the horizon and a tramp masturbating in the corner, that will immediately have some bearing on their life. Yes. As artists, you have a very composed attitude, a very positive attitude to the, towards the viewer. As individual, does, is, is it imaginable that you shout, that you get mad? Maybe, maybe in our art, but not in our life. We have to be very controlled and very regimented. We live in a simpler way than anybody else we know in, in order to be sometimes extreme in our pictures. Yes. We do shout in the world of Gilbert and George, don't we? Yes. In, in our movie we do, yes. yes. <laughs> we, have, we have a picture called The Scream of Reason. Yes. <laughs> the Scream of Reason, and we always have to put on uh, responsibility suits of our life. Huh? It's always very important. Always, people always 
fuss about why we dress and why we have the suits and things. It's, it's very simple. When we get on the aeroplane, there's always a nice person who says, oh, how marvellous to see well-dressed people flying. <laughs> I've been a stewardess for years, but nobody dresses. It's marvellous. I'll just check if Rick's blues is there. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Brazil is a very uh, a country where it's very difficult to survive and even more to try to making some art. Everything we do there turns out to be political and against the system. My question is: You say you you, uh, you guys always prefer to be uh, for things, not against. Then uh, I would like to know: Were were things always easy for you to, to yes, make you guys choose? Yeah. To be always for and not use our yeah. art to 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 fight yeah. to be against. Things. I understand this. That's very simple because we are very subversive. <laughs> we are very subversive. But it was quite interesting because we are art. No, from the first day on, we were outside. Uh, and we had to fight for every, every single day of our life. We had to fight for our survival because it was extraordinary world that was against us in many, many ways, and still is. We call them the frowning classes. They want to, once they see a Gilbert and George picture, they frown. They are not supporting it. So in some way, we had to fight day and night for our vision to be visible. And I mean, we like Brazil. We went there. We had a, what you call, a, not Louis Paragon. We did, a, we did a small piece in Lina Bobardi. The architect, yes. And we exciting. always try to do a show there because, because they are so very good looking people in Brazil. <laughs> half, half, half the people who stop us on the street to say they love our art say, why didn't you show in my country? And it's nearly always a Latin American country. But at the moment I feel they are quite anti-art in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil. The, what they call it, they are religious maniacs who are trying to reverse everything that is artistic. Yeah, that's the, the, politi the politicians are too interested in sex in the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, it's about what people do. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <coughs> There's another one up there. I think we've just been hearing one more quick question. I think we have to end then. Yes, I have a curiosity. Uh, you are uh, seem always impeccable, like a uh, genuine gentleman. Uh, your tailor is rich. <laughs> the what? Say, say it now, now. Your tailor is rich. You seem always oh. impeccable, like genuine gentleman. Oh, no, we, we, we I had the curiosity, uh, your tailor is rich? No. No, we, had, we, we were very lucky. We had, from our earliest day, we had a, a tailor who was living next door to us. He was, he was an elderly German Jewish tailor called Mr. Lustig. And when, when he died, we were sold on to the next. Mr. Chapman. Mr. Chapman, and then we were sold on to Mr. Liebenberg. Then we were huge, sold A huge uh, range of da Jewish tailors. Uh, David of London, another Jewish tailor. We've and then in the end, because all the sons of the Jewish tailors don't want to be tailors anymore, what do they want to be? And we, the, our last, last Jewish tailor said that they were retiring to Portugal in order to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we said, why didn't you? Why, why didn't you, you have sons who are 29 and 35, couldn't they take over the business? And he said, what do you call the son of a Jewish tailor? I said, I have no idea. He said, a brain surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have a tailor who is trained in Tibet. So that's quite exciting. Because we never want a, a perfect suit. It has to be a f suit that fits into every system, no? We always say if you take one suit from every decade, of the 20th century and, and two from this century and put them into a computer and press the average button, this would be roughly what you end up with. So, uh, thank, you. <coughs> thank you all very, very much for coming. And um, particularly thank you to Gilbert and George. And I think, if nothing else, um, the art of Gilbert and George has been championing, I think, free speech about all. Oh, yes. Uh, over 50 years and we need that more than ever i think so thank you Gilbert and thank you thank you, thank you.